want to say thank you to all the people who are here, my, some of my professors, my parents, um, some of my really good friends too. Um, secondly, I want to say a big thank you to everyone in Undergraduate Student Senate for thinking of this initiative. Sort of hits at actually what I get in my lecture about how we think of these ideas um, and for executing it. Because sometimes you can have the greatest ideas, but they never really come to fruition. So thank you. Actually, it's good to know. So I titled this lecture, um, What I've Learned Here. And um, I want to start it off by posing a question to you. What have you learned at Carnegie Mellon? That was the question that I was asked, and it's a real big one. Um, and really, for a long time, I couldn't answer it. And it wasn't because I hadn't learned anything. It's because probably I learned too much. Um, I didn't just answer that question. This is really the question I answered. What have you learned at Carnegie Mellon, really? It transcends what you learn in the classroom and even what you learn outside of it. It asks how you've changed as an individual, how you've matured, how you've grown into someone that you've aspired to be. It's the question I've answered in creating this lecture. The first thing that I did, we go to Carnegie Mellon, just keep that in the back of your mind. The way that we solve problems and the way that we even think of new things and innovate is by breaking things down to best understand them. That's often what I do. So I consulted one of my best friends, the dictionary, to understand really what learning is. Learning is to acquire knowledge by way of three different things. Study, instruction, keyword, or experience. That's the definition of it. Um, didn't really sit with me, like a lot of things that I want to change and improve. It didn't sit with me for mainly two reasons. The first one is that if you take my time here, right, and my personal knowledge that I've gained as an individual, what do you think that, that would look as a function? It's pretty linear. You know, you learn each day, and you go to class, and you're guaranteed to learn at least one thing, but in the same amount every day. Didn't really sit, with, sit very, very good with me. The second reason, those three pillars, as if we can sort of compartmentalize them into three different ways of thinking, you know, study, instruction and experience, but what I've learned at Carnegie Mellon is there are no compartmentalized ways of thinking. These three bins, if you want to call them, actually is one. Because what you learn inside the classroom and what you learn outside of it interact in a way that creates a type of synergy that I try and sort of tell people when I talk to them about what the Carnegie Mellon experience really is. So. The first thing that this lecture does is challenge the way we define learning. It's the first one. In grappling what this definition is, I had the ability to run across research um, by someone who you might know. His name is Herbert Simon. And what I'm hoping this lecture is about, it's not just about me, it's about this university. And if you want to think about why Carnegie Mellon is the way it is, and in turn, why you are the way you are. It's because of that man. And what he said leading up to his death, he died in, I think, 2001, 2002. One of the last things that he said was that learning causes a change in behavior. And namely, if that change doesn't occur in you, you really haven't learned. Probably one of the most intelligent people to walk on this campus. He was a professor, a lecturer, uh, a researcher, a social scientist, an economist. Nobel Prize winner on this campus. That's what he said. So I took his words, this piece of insight that he had given me so indirectly that I actually, actually stumbled upon it, and I took that and I read a ton of different things, a ton of other things, other people's perspectives and how they define learning. And over a period of, I would say, maybe even a month, it took me about a month to, to really understand what it is, and I, I tend to overdo things you might, you might Gotcha. But it took me a while. What I arrived at is adding one word to this slide, uh, and it changes it entirely. That word is significant. Now, when you think of significance, you think of real deep meaning. Deep meaning that can change the way that you think and you act, even your own personality. When you learn at Carnegie Mellon, you learn significantly. Simple as that. You don't just learn. 
When you learn significantly, I will tell you this. Your toils create something that you might not even know had existed. And it's this. It's called insight. Real insight. There's actually surprising literature done on why we arrive at insight. I don't really call it insight. I call it more personal illumination, if that makes any sense. It's not just insight about something. It's insight that's relevant to me. You take that personal illumination perspective and you go back into the literature and you think of really how is that sort of phrased among social scientists, it's defined by an aha moment or a eureka moment. And there's actually a lot of literature and research done on why we arrive at those the way we do. Researchers have classified it into four camps. Um, it's classified by suddenness. It sort of comes out of nowhere. Second one is ease. It comes fluently almost, as if it had been latent there for forever. Confidence. You believe in what you arrived at relatively quickly. And my favorite, which probably is the most confusing one, positive affect. Now, if you think of what affect is, it's actually an emotional response. So it's a cognitive way of approaching problems that elicit an emotional response within the learner. That's what's happened to me as a student of this university. When, you, when you're at Carnegie Mellon, too, um, you don't just arrive at one insight. I, at least I would hope. I don't think we have. You create a vast web of insights. Webs that are connected in different ways. And when you get as old as I am, at least to the students out there, you create a more intricate web. And if you start looking at people not as people, but as webs of information and insight, you can learn from everyone that you speak with. They're not just people. They're people and experiences. Experiences that change the way they think, act, and behave. This is my web. Let's leave it as that. Tonight, I want to tell you, too, that in creating that web, one of the biggest things that I had to do is focus. So what is focus? Why do some people have it? Why, why do people some not have it? Well, focus is attention. It's dedication. It's willpower. It's willingness to go when you really don't want to go anymore. It's the biggest thing I could tell you as students of this university. Sometimes that web might seem like it won't be able to form itself, but when you apply focus to it, I guarantee you that it will. Tonight I want to share with you three of the main insights from my web. Just three. I couldn't do, I, I would do a lot more, but I could. <laughs> three. Come in. <laughs> Let's start with the first one. She came at the right time. <laughs> we'll start with this. Um, let's see. Strive for excellence. Um, I think when, even when I tell you what excellence is, it often gets confused with another very similar word, uh, and that is perfection. And as students at as of Carnegie Mellon, we obsess about trying to be the best. What is the best? Is it excellence? Is it perfection? I didn't really know when I got here. But what I'm telling you, what I've realized, is that in order to be excellent, you need to strive for it. I'm going to start this off with a story. I'll just leave that sort of sitting there. Uh, when I was a sophomore in my second semester here, I was extended an opportunity uh, to partake in a program called Odyssey. Some of you might have participated. Some of you are smiling because you did it with me. Um, basically, Odyssey is a way for undergraduates to gain the most, quote unquote, the most out of the undergraduate experience. It teaches you about your writing skills. It teaches you about your personal skills, your interpersonal skills, why essentially you are the way you are. It's only about three days, but those are probably the most intense days I've been on this campus because I sort of did it alone. You're in a group, uh, you're in a very select group, and you, there's really no one on campus to, to talk with. It's sort of like they lock you in a room and say, okay, here's this insight, deal with it. And if that insight changes the way that you think about things, then so be it. You'll be better in about a week or so. That's what that program did for me. If I, I made it sound like death, but it's great. It's great. It's a great one. What it really, did, what it really did for me is um, make me think about that. Who do you think you are as a person? 
That's not where it ended up. Actually, where it ended up was aligning it with how others perceive who you are. Now, that's an exercise that not very many people do. Because the second one on the screen causes anxiety. It causes you to seek out opinions that maybe you really don't want to hear. Maybe I'm not perfect. Maybe I'm not the person that I really think I am. But that's what I learned through going through that program. In doing it, one of the prerequisites for it, uh, again, I highly suggest that you do it because you'll, you'll learn a ton from it. One of the prerequisites is what they call the best self exercise. And I would really suggest that you think about it. And you need to go through the program to do it. It's just something that you do that will sort of shed light on really who you are. Essentially what it is, is you seek out people who know you the best. Maybe it's a list of 10 people, 15 people, your friends, your family, your instructors, the people in, commu in your communities who know you the best. Then you ask them a question. That question is, when was I at my best? When was I so good that it made you remember and strive to be like? What adjectives do you think they used to describe you in that situation? Well, it sheds light on really who you are. Because the people who you love and the people who you are so good friends with remember those situations. And they're the ones who tell you these, these things. Well, here's the, here are the results when, I, again, I was a sophomore. Now, let's start with how I thought of myself, okay? I knew I was determined, whatever that means. This is what I wrote down. I actually consulted what I had written down going through the program. I knew I was determined. I take that anyway. I knew I was balanced. I did a lot of different things. I never sort of pigeonholed pigeon myself into one activity. I wanted to be in and out of 10 different ones. And really, to summarize it, I thought I was perfect. Yeah. Straight up. I really thought I was perfect. Your mother says you are perfect. Thanks. <laughs> Well, here's the hard part. Here's the hard part. This is what other people said about me. He's a leader. Now, leadership might be sort of overexhausted in I'm a leader. Are you a leader? Who's really a follower? I don't know. But you know what? When someone says you are, it changes what you think about leadership. Because it's not just you saying it, it's what other people are telling you. Again, this is what other people said about me. The second thing, he really cares about everything that he does. I never really thought and took a step back to realize that. That I do opportunities just really to do them. And I don't say no. Some lectures will, say, will tell you the power of no. I don't really believe in that. Because the more things you take on, back to the synergy that I said in the beginning, the better your synergy is. The more things learn to complement each other. And lastly, in direct reference to that last one, he wants perfection. He's not perfect. That changed the way I think about myself. He wants perfection. Now, some of you may know I'm, I mean, I'm also a musician. I've been playing the trumpet for about 13 years. I had to throw up an image of her so you know that I play. Um, <laughs> some of you do, though. But I learned unconventionally. I learned through private lesson. Essentially, I, I meet each week with an instructor, um, and he teaches me how to play the instrument. It's basically how I learned up until actually right now. I'm part of the Carnegie Mellon Music Extension Program, and I still take private lessons. Highly recommend that program, by the way. I started in the fourth grade, and um, my instructor will probably watch this video and, and critique it. But um, what I will tell you is it was an accelerated way of learning. And I think it was probably within the first, maybe in the first year of me learning how to play, we dived into music theory. Really, how do you play this instrument? And what are the tones that are coming out of it, and why do they sound the way they do? Well, the circle of fifths is something that resonates with me for not only musical reasons, and you'll see why. Essentially, the circle of fifths is just a visual representation of musical tones. It tells you, you know, on the left you have flats, on the right, you have sharps. And it tells you which particular key signature that a musical piece is written in. It's just musical terminology, but it's actually very useful for learning scales and learning instruments. Here, here, here's the aha moment, OK? And this is how it relates to um, my, my journey through Odyssey program. Now, keep in mind, this has happened 
I think about at the moment 10 years prior for me to me doing Odyssey. What he did was something I don't think I'll ever forget. He took the piece of paper that the Circle of Fifths was written on, and he erased everything on it. And I looked at him, and he looked at me, and he said, Stephen, uh, this is what we're going to call um, the Circle of Excellence. Circle of Excellence. At that point, I didn't even know how to spell the word excellent. I was in fourth grade. What he asked me after that was something I don't think I'll ever forget as well. He said, are you in it? Namely, are you here or are you there? Outside the circle with two of your friends talking about the circle of excellence. If you think about it, about what he taught me in that situation, excellence is never ending. The circle of excellence never begins and it never ends. Very different than perfection, isn't it? So what I want you to do here is strive for excellence in everything that you do, or at least try to. Ask yourself whether you're in or you're out. And then surround yourself with people who are in. That's my first lesson. It's very heavy. I'm getting, I'm getting exhausted. <laughs> Second lesson. Bringing back some dark memories. Second lesson. This is my favorite. Uh, this is my favorite one. Second lesson. People come first. People. We tend not to think about individuals as individuals. We think them. We might think of them as uh, as tools to get to the next level or to to learn just for me. You know, they're laughing because they're in it. Um, <laughs> but people come first, and you know what? It's not just me saying it. Actually, it's social science empirical research telling me it. Inter investing in others. Uh, rather than yourself, actually has measurable benefit for your own happiness. That study was actually done longitudinally, so they looked over a period of time, and they followed people who had dispensable income, and whether or not they would invest in themselves in, let's say, expensive consumer goods, or if they were to give it to charity, or they were to buy gifts for other individuals. Well, the latter group was actually significantly more happy in the long run. Second piece of research. Giving social support, what is social support? Emotional support, informational support, networking support. Giving social support is an important component of any interpersonal relationship. And it has actually considerable value for your own health and well-being. And this, this study actually said, in going so, in so far as saying, giving benefit is actually better than receiving it. Giving it away. Pretty mind-opening. Eye opening and mind opening. Now, this, this image tells a really uh, hard story for me, at least. Up in the corner, it says year one. Let's, let's picture Steve as a little freshman. Um, Steve was obsessed about doing well. Steve was obsessed about making sure that other people knew he was good a good person, a good student, a good learner, a good listener, a good everything. So much so that I actually catty cornered my own self in a corner that no one else was in. Everyone else was succeeding down here, but I didn't care about it. And actually, if you told me you succeeded, I didn't really want you to succeed. It's the way I really thought when I got here. Pretty flawed. Pretty flawed. But you know what? When I went through my second year, things got easier because I moved down. And I started looking through the hole of realizing that in order to inspire, you need to be inspired first. You need to listen around you to know what other people are doing. You don't sort of just catty corner yourself alone and think that great things are going to come by themselves because they don't. And here's the real interesting one. By years three and four, I had surrounded myself around people who were successful. I started listening intensively to what other people were doing so that I couldn't use them or be better than them, but incorporate them into my own success. And when I mean success, some of you might say, well, well what's success? I don't really know, but in my eyes, and as a student, as a student of Carnegie Mellon, it could be doing well on the next exam, or it could be influencing to get something that you want because you know it's good for your organization. All of us do this every day. Success is up for you to define, but what I'm telling you is that when you put people first, I guarantee you that your trajectory of success will be never-ending, really. 
So let's put people first, really, in everything that we do. Let's think about not only ourselves, but also acting maybe pro-socially, or acting in ways that don't only favor the way that we operate. That's my second lesson. Now the last one, I, I hopefully I'm not over time, but the last one, embracing vulnerability. Um, this is a big one. A big one in the sense that if you, didn't, you don't know it, uh, you're about to learn it, and it's going to really project you into becoming better individuals. I don't care what age. I really don't. I don't care what your web looks like. Embracing vulnerability, what is vulnerability, I'll get to in a minute, but embracing this fact of being uncomfortable in anything that you do makes you a better individual. What is vulnerability? I think um, a woman by the name of Brene Brown defined it the absolute best. I would really suggest you watch the TEDx video. Uh, it has like 15 million views on it. Really would recommend it. She did it in 2010. What she said about vulnerability, to feel is to be vulnerable. To feel. Now you think of feeling, you think of my emotions, you think of my relationships with other people. In order to form those, you need to be vulnerable. In order to connect with other individuals, and what she really does say is that as human beings, all we want is connection. All we want is to be wanted. For example, after this lecture, I'd want to know from my parents that I did a good job. I want to be validated. I want to be told that, you know what, Steve, you did a good job. You learned a lot from being here at Carnegie Mellon. People want to be connected in that sense. They want to be validated. They want to feel like you were listening to me. Not just some random person, but me. Me. Whoever me is. That's what Bernie Brown said. This equation is a real difficult one. When I came to Carnegie Mellon, I knew I was taking a real big risk. But over my time here, I realized that everything that is a value, everything that is a value in the sense that it can change you, it can change the way that you influence people or, or lead them, it's risky, but it's possibly the greatest thing that can happen. What I'm here to tell you tonight are the three tools to, to start realizing this and to start embracing vulnerability and the three questions. And if you think about it, how do you really learn? It starts with asking a question. And the first one is, why? Why are we here right now? Why does Carnegie Mellon really exist? Why is it better ranked than the next one? Why am I a better student graduating from this university than someone else? Why? The next is how else? And I learned this when I was a, a senior in high school. Asking how else that could have been done. How else could that have been said, executed, learned? Ask that question. And the last one I think is the most powerful one. What if? What if things were different? What if I was in a different university? What if I was in a different life? Would I really be speaking up here? I don't know. I have no clue. But like I said, when I came to Carnegie Mellon, I made a decision that had considerable risk. And what I'm here to tell you tonight is that it did pay off. And that sometimes when it seems so hard to get through this web, you will. Because you will be starting to embrace vulnerability for what it really is. And you combine that with the focus, attention, time, energy, day in and day out. Being excellent is not the one day off gig. You gotta be excellent in everything that you do. And that might sound extreme, but that's the one thing I tell you to all be extreme in. Because not very many people are so excellent. They think they are, but they don't really know that circle of excellence. They haven't really drawn it for themselves. They're in the, in the out group talking with their friends about really what it is. They don't really know. In order to summarize this lecture, uh, I put up an image. You can't really see it, but it's Mountain Washington. And uh, I so vividly remember when I was a freshman, um, finishing my formal pledge ship in my fraternity. One of the things that we did, a lot of people in my fraternity are here. One of the things that we did was uh, we went to Mount Washington to watch the sunrise. And you want to apply meaning to something, right? You want to understand really why are we doing this? Well, my aha moment really happened only a couple days ago. This image for me tells my entire undergraduate experience. A rising sun is something that happens every day. 
you get the opportunity to learn every single day. And you know what? When you shine, you shine out on ignorance about things that aren't right, things that could be better, but you know what? Really, no one else wants to do it. About teaching people and influencing pe people in positive ways, not negative ways. The last things I will leave you with are the three points that I covered. Strive for excellence in everything that you do, not perfection. Especially coming from Carnegie Mellon, I never even knew in a million years that I'd be telling other people not to be perfect. Don't do it. Don't fall in the trap because you'll never succeed fully. Put people first. Realize that everything is not about you, whoever you are. You're in an interconnected web of individuals that want to see you succeed. Use them as tools to do so. Listen, and then you will be listened to. And lastly, embrace vulnerability. Remember this image. Remember your time here and how this talk relates to it. And what I will tell you is when you do these three things and you, and you incorporate them into your everyday lifestyle, I guarantee you that you too will be on a path to learning significantly. Thank you.